67 polymerase in multiple ways. Chiefly, in vitro transcription, where we make RNA copies of DNA templates, and as well as getting bacteria to make uh, protein on demand. So look, we have these T7 inducible systems. And so how do we do all of this? Um, where does this T7 come from? How does it discovered? And what are some of the technical things to know about using it um, for in vitro transcription in particular, as well as a little bit on the um, inducible expression, but I have more on that in another post. Um, okay, so let's dive in. So just quickly getting on the same page in terms of some of the terminology. So the instructions for making a protein are in the form of DNA, um, in the form of genes. And then we messenger RNA copies of that DNA are made in this process called transcription. This is what the T7 RNA polymerase is going to do. When you make messenger RNA, it then gets used by these complexes called ribosomes in order to make proteins. So messenger RNAs serve as these intermediates between DNA and protein. There are also other forms of RNA that do things like act as functional RNA, so they act at the RNA level alone. So for various reasons, you would want to be able to make RNA in a lab, like in a test tube, so in vitro, or make messenger RNA inside of a cell and get that cell to make the protein for you, which is the case if we do this in bacteria and we can get the bacteria to overexpress the protein. So we can do this by controlling when T7 gets made as well as where T7 is going to act. Because remember, T7 RNA polymerase, I'm saying T7, but really I'm talking about it's RNA polymerase, it's going to make MR it's going to make RNA copies of DNA, so it's going to transcribe, but only in specific places, and it's only going to transcribe when it has its promoter. And so it's going to use a different promoter sequence, so the sequence that it recognizes and starts making the um, RNA from, it's going to use a different promoter than the bacteria of one. So what it, why, so T7 is like this virus, it's a bacteriophage, a phage, we call these usually, um, instead of bacteriophage, we just shorten it to phage, um, but these are viruses that infect bacteria. And so T7 RNA polymerase is going to infect bacteria and then it has, it'll get the bacteria to make RNA, messenger RNAs of its protein, of its DNA, and then make proteins for it. And so we'll talk more about this in a minute, but basically because it has its own genome, it has its own DNA it's putting in there, it wants to make sure that the bacteria make its stuff and not the bacteria stuff. And so it uses a different promoter sequence and it makes its own T it makes its own RNA polymerase so it doesn't have to rely on the bacterial one and it can even inhibit the bacterial one. So we have this key thing where we T7 RNA polymerase is going to make RNA copies of DNA that is in front of its promoter sequence. So now what we can do is we can take that promoter sequence and we can stick it in front of a gene that we want um, to make RNA, of, an RNA copy of it. Um, and so we can stick it in front of a sequence of interest to make lots of RNA from it. We can do this in vitro, um, so kind of like in a test tube outside of cells, um, and we can do this with really pure conditions um, and like the minimal components that we need, and then we can purify it and use it. And so this would be like in vitro transcription. How we use it, it can vary. Um, so what we can do is we can actually take that messenger RNA and we can stick it inside of cells. Um, and so this is the idea with like messenger RNA vaccines, um, where the RNA, the messenger RNA is going to be in vitro transcribed by T7 RNA polymerase. Uh, more in, in I'll talk more about in vitro transcription um, in a minute. Um, but then this RNA can then be put into cells, often in the form of these like lipid nanoparticles to help it get inside. And then the cells will make the protein from it. We can also do things um, with in vitro transcribed messenger RNAs um, doing in vitro translation as well. So you use these messenger RNAs as templates in a cell-free system. So this can be either a system that's lysate-based. Um, so basically everything but the cellular membranes and stuff, plus some extra stuff added in there to make it more efficient. Um, or it can be reconstituted from the individual components, such as like in this pure system. And so you can use this if you're doing messenger RNA, um, but you can also make are different types of RNA. And so it doesn't care. It's just going to make a template. It doesn't know what the template's making for, 
is. Um, and so there are other types of RNA. Like I told you, there's like the functional RNAs and various things. You might want to make RNA probes, um, various reasons why you might want to have RNA, um, structural studies, various, various things that you would want RNA for that you wouldn't want it to, to be used as messenger RNA. Um, you can also use messenger RNA for things like toe printing, um, which I talked about in another post, and I'm not going to get into it here, but basically you're identifying where ribosomes are located on a messenger RNA. Okay, but in those cases, if you're doing in vitro transcription, you're just doing it to make the RNA, and then you can do various things with that RNA, but it's separate steps. You can also use it for recombinant protein overexpression. Um, and so in this case, you would have the, um, it happening in bacteria. And basically what you're doing is you're getting the bacteria to do the transcription and the translation. So transcription, remember, is the RNA um, making from making RNA from the DNA template. And then the um, translation is going to be making protein from that template. In bacteria, transcription and translation are coupled. They don't have um, they don't have like um, a nucleus where the DNA is held and then the messenger RNA gets shipped down to the cytoplasm where the ribosomes are. Instead in bacteria, it's all kind of like happening in the same place. And so you have this coupling of transcription and translation. So if you can get that messenger RNA to be transcribed, it'll also get translated inside of these cells. So what you can do, though, is in order to, so you can put the T7 promoter in front of the gene that you want expressed, and you can actually do this cool thing um, where you can induce the expression of T7 RNA polymerase. When you induce the expression of T7 RNA polymerase, typically using an IPTG system, um, taking advantage of like the LAC operon, which I talk about in another post. But basically, when you add IPTG, you get um, T7 RNA polymerase made um, and then the T7 RNA polymerase will go to work making RNA um, from the sequences that have the T7 promoter in front of them. And because this T7 promoter is this viral promoter, it's not like the bacteria's promoter, um, it's not going to be in the bacterial's genes. It's not going to be making the bacteria stuff, it's going to be making your stuff. And because you're like overexpressing, you're going to make oodles and oodles of it. Um, and so this is a really great way to get a protein overexpressed in bacteria. But today I want to focus more on the in vitro transcription steps as well as where this where this T7 RNA polymerase comes from in the first place. So as I've shown you, there's multiple use ways that we can take advantage of T7 RNA polymerase. Um, but in order to be able to take advantage of it, we need to like discover it. Um, and so it comes from this T7 phage. Um, so T7 was named by Demerck and Fano in 1945. Um, it, the seven become, is because it was the seventh of seven phage types that they were describing in their study, um, but it's been studied since the 30s under different names, um, like Delta, um, various names, so it can get kind of confusing if you look into the older literature, but um, if you want to know more, I recommend this um, cool article, um, this review article. Um, but going back to this T7, and so the pioneering work that we're going to be looking at is going to be this paper um, from 1970, um, Michael Chamberlain, Janet McGrath, and Lucy Waskell um, from UC Berkeley. Um, and this paper where they're discovering this T7 RNA polymerase. It's a really cool paper, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it. Um, but let me just start by kind of going over what they found, and then it'll make the results will hopefully make a little more sense and we, if we are all like knowing the answers beforehand. So bacteria, T7, as I talked about, is a bacteriophage. Um, it has a double-stranded DNA genome. Um, and so this means that it needs the bacteria to make the RNA for its proteins and then make the proteins. So we've been hearing a lot about SARS-CoV-2, so the coronavirus, and it's a single-stranded RNA um, genome. And so it had in its the positive strand. Um, so basically, this means that it's already to go, its, it's RNA is already to go when it goes into a cell. But with T7, it needs to make the RNA first, and so it's going to use its RNA promoter, um, RNA polymerase, in order to do this. But in order to do that, it needs to have the bacteria first make the RNA polymerase. And so some of the genes in T7 are going to be under these early promoters that are going to use the bacterial RNA polymerase, and then some of them are going to be late ones that are going to use the T7 RNA polymerase. So the early genes are under the control of the bacterial RNA polymerase, and then the later ones will be under T7. And so the early ones are going to include things like 
the T7 RNA polymerase so that it can make the late gene um, mRNAs, as well as proteins that shut down bacterial transcription. So there's like this gene 0.7. So I'm thinking that they must, they named it that because they thought they found the first, they found it after they what they found was the first was the first gene, um, but I'm not exactly sure. Uh, but it codes for this kinase, so this small this enzyme that's going to phosphorylate, so it adds this negatively charged phosphate group to the bacterial RNA polymerase, somewhat crippling it. Um, and there are other early genes like 0 0.3, um, which in, has um, a protein product that inhibits the bacteria's restriction enzymes, the, which is the bacterial one of the bacterial's defense system that it uses to cut foreign DNA. And so the end result is the bacterium is going to stop transcribing its own RNA and has its defenses dampened. But by this point, the T7 RNA, um, the T7 virus has already started making its own T7 RNA polymerase so it can start making its own stuff. I um, mean, transcribe its later genes. What's really, really cool is that it kind of like it actually, so it docks on the, onto the surface of the bacteria and then it starts injecting its DNA. The early genes are going to be like injected first and the bacteria is gonna start making it and the transcription is actually going to start pull, help pull the DNA inside. But this is gonna be, um, it, the E. coli RNA polymerase isn't as fast. And so you're gonna have this like slowish time when the E. coli RNA polymerase is going to be making all the stuff that it needs and then the T7 will take over and it'll kind of, it'll go really fast and really pull everything through. So it's really cool. Um, and now the it has the ribosomes all to itself because it shut down those bacteria ones and now it's going to start making things under those T7 late promoters. And so this is um, what we now know about where this T7 RNA polymerase comes from. And so now you can buy this commercially um, as well as you can express and purify it yourself. Um, and so I'm actually planning to express and purify it myself, which is why I've been um, thinking about T7 RNA polymerase so much. I'm gonna do some in vitro transcription. And um, I was seeing a lot of papers that they were saying that you get a lot, um, it makes a lot of sense to make your own, even though you can buy it commercially. Um, when you make it yourself, it's a lot more active. You get a higher concentration, so you don't need to add as much. Um, it's like supposedly like a simple um, purification where you get a high yield. Um, so I should only have to do this like once and have enough for a long time. Um, so that's the hope. Okay, but anyway. Moving forward, so how did they find all of this? And then we'll talk about how um, some practical details for when we're using it. Okay, so basically they, a while, they saw that a while after the phage infects a bacterium, the T7 stops expressing some of its genes and start, switches to expressing different genes. So this is what I just talked about in terms of what we, what like the overview of the summary of the results was that you're switching from those early to late genes. And so the scientists were trying to figure out what was going on here. Um, and they thought this would be a cool um, thing to study in forms of like gene regulation, various things. And so an early idea was that the bacteria RNA polymerase had um, a separate sub, that the phage made its own subunit for this bacterial RNA polymerase. So RNA polymerase is an enzyme, so it's a reaction speeder upper. Um, sometimes some RNA polymerases, most of them, um, are going to have multiple subunits. So they're made up of multiple protein chains, like broken together. So the E. coli RNA polymerase, it has this core and then it has this um, sigma subunit. And the sigma segment subunit is important for the promoter recognition. So it's important to figure out where to bind and start transcribing. And so people thought that maybe the phage made its own um, sigma subunit that it could then use with the bacterial RNA polymerase. But they would find that the phage makes its own RNA polymerase and it's only a single subunit. And so this is one of the reasons why it's a really helpful tool in biochemistry um, and why we can express and purify it more easily is because it's just a single subunit. It's just a single protein that we need to express and purify. Um, and then it's super duper useful because it's really, really efficient. It's really fast um, and it's really specific. So it's only going to make uh, RNA from the things that have the T7 promoter. Okay, and so it's, um, as I mentioned, it, this discovery was um, described in this paper 
Um, and so how did they find it? Basically, they used a variety of different um, purification and separation steps, such as ion exchange chromatography, where they're basically separating proteins based on their charges. Um, and then they could test different fractions. So they take this bacteria that were infected by this virus, and then they were able to um, separate out different proteins in that bacterial mixture. Um, and then they, they kind of like chase the different fractions. So you have things coming out, um, say, say you're doing an ion exchange chromatography. So you'd have things coming out at different salt concentrations based on their charge. Um, and then you can collect little fractions and test those fractions for activity. Um, and in order to determine the activity, they were testing, um, basically they had T7 DNA, and then they had just had this, um, eight, this strand of A's and T's. And so the T7, um, you would imagine that the T7 polymerase is going to have a higher activity towards its own DNA because that DNA has its own promoter, as opposed to just this um, ATATAT strand. Um, and so there's these two fractions here, um, 5A and 5B. And so they saw that 5A had this really high specific activity um, for this T7 DNA. And so specific activity, when I say like specific, that's just like we're kind of um, normalizing it in terms of like units. So some measure of activity um, per like MIG. More on this in another post. But basically the, um, the T7 DNA, um, um, sorry, I need to reread this again. Um, I'm not sure with the, with the AT, if it's AT, AT, or if it's like a strand of A and a strand of T. Um, but some random, I mean, but some like non-specific sequence. Okay, so you have this T7 infected E. coli, and you see that the 5A fraction has this high a ratio of T7 to DAT, um, and this T7, the 5B, has this um, lower ratio, and it has higher activity towards just this DAT. Um, and so it looks like this 5A is more like the T7 RNA polymerase, and the 5B is more like the, um, the E. coli polymerase. Um, and here they're just showing that the they're comparing the core E. coli RNA polymerase and the holoenzyme. So the holoenzyme is when it has that subunit. Um, and you can see that when it has a subunit, um, it's going to have the higher activity, but it still has this low ratio of um, T7 to DAT. Okay, so it well, how does 5A behave? So they want to determine more about the specificity for this T7 RNA polymerase. So, so they tested different things. They found it really likes templates that were full of Cs, and it likes its own DNA way, way better than that of other phages that they tested. So it's really picky, and this pickiness is, makes it really useful in the lab. Um, they wanted to further characterize it, um, so they did a couple of different things. They used this thing called zone sedimentation and a glycerol gradient to estimate its native size. So by native, like its whole thing, not denatured, not separated into individual subunits, because remember, they didn't know if there were individual subunits. Um, but here they um, combine that with this. They show that they see in the SDS page. So here you're denaturing, so you're unfolding the proteins. Complexes are going to come apart, and you're separating things based on their length. And you can see that the RNA, this is the E. coli RNA polymerase. You have two different bands, this thing you can see. Um, with the T7 RNA polymerase, these are just different fractions. So this is all the T7 RNA polymerase. You can see that you have just like this single band representing a single protein and that it corresponds to the weight that you would expect based on this gradient. Um, so it seems like it really is a single um, subunit um, enzyme. They further did things like testing and see, they saw that it wasn't inhibited by bacterial RNA polymerase inhibitors, such as streptolygdin and rifamycin. Um, and they took advantage of this so that they could more easily purify their T7 RNA polymerase. So basically, if you add these bacterial RNA polymerase inhibitors, then that would um, like remove all of the activity from this other polymerase so that if you're just trying to follow polymerase activity, like you're chasing down the activity in these fractions, you're only going to be chasing down the activity that you want and you're not going to get um, like led astray by the bacterial activity. Okay, so that's the protein, but where was it coming from? And so finding the T7 RNA polymerase gene, remember we have these earlier late genes, um, and so they wanted to, they did samples like over time 
um, where they were measuring the ability to of uh, transcribing and basically they and what was getting transcribed. And so they used this radio labeled CTP um, so they could see when the RNA got made based on it being radioactive. And they detect this activity soon after infection. So they say it's an early gene. So they inhibited the bacteria. So any RNA that's made is going to be from the T7 RNA polymerase. And they see that it gets made early. Um, and so, but which gene was the T7 RNA polymerase? They know that it's getting made, but where is it made from? Um, so they only knew of three early genes um, and they didn't know what those genes did. So they named them one, two, and three. And then they tested T7s with mutations in each of those. And they saw basically they were introducing these like amber mutations. So this is a stop, they're introducing a stop codon. So instead of telling the ribosome to add a certain amino acid, it says stop. And so they said that when they, the gene two and gene three still had the RNA activity, um, RNA polymerase activity, but the gene one null mutant had basically none. And further supporting the, that this was the um, T7 RNA polymerase, they found that temperature sensitive mutant, so basically where it's active at one temperature, but inactive at another, it um, had some activity um, that was then lost. So it, this mutation, like you can see the effect. Um, and so they were able to say, okay, that this is the gene. And so now we can, yeah, we can take advantage of this. And so um, we can do things like doing this in vitro transcription and making protein inside of cells. And so I want to talk more about this in vitro transcription. And so here we're going to basically, we're going to take a DNA template and we're going to give it um, T7 RNA polymerase. Um, and we what do we need for this template? So basically we need to have the T7 promoter in front of whatever sequence that we want it to make RNA from. And then it kind of depends. So if you have, you can ha imagine you have a circular template or you have a linear template. So a circular template would be like a plasmid. Then you can have host these in bacteria and have the bacteria make lots and lots of copies of them, um, clone them with things like restriction enzymes or PCR-based methods like SLIC. Um, and if these are uncut, then you need to have a terminator to tell the RNA polymerase where to stop. So the T7 promoter is going to tell it where to start and the T7 terminator is going to tell it where to stop. So if you have a circular template, you're going to need a terminator in order to tell it where to stop. And so this is true for the in vitro transcription as well as when you're doing a, um, when you're doing like um, this protein overexpression, you're going to want to have a, a termination se sequence as well. And so basically this is going to like fold up into this weird structure that's going to cause it to stop. Um, if you have a linear template, however, you don't need that um, terminator because instead the RNA polymerase is just gonna go until it falls off. Um, and so you can get your template linearized if you use a restriction enzyme. So a enzyme that recognizes a specific DNA sequence and cuts it. So these, um, you can have a restriction enzyme cut site right after your gene and then you can cut it off and now you have this end. Um, and you can also generate a linear plasmid using PCR. So basically, if you had something in a plasmid, even if it didn't have a T7 promoter, you can add it on in your primer, or you could, if you had it in your plasmid already, you can just um, use a primer that's going to start there. And so with the PCR, you're going to make DNA copies of the sequence that is in between these two primers. So these two short oligos to short nucleates um, DNA sequences that are going to bookend the region you want copied and more on this and other posts, but you're going to copy the region in between those. You can use the primer to add this T7 promoter on, or if you use a um, plasmid, they're like commercially available plasmids you can get where they have the T7 promoter in front of a gene, um, sometimes with tags, various things like that. Um, and then often what they'll have is they'll have a poly A sequence as well. So when our um, so pre, so when we go from like trans, when we transcribe a DNA in our cells, it's going to have, um, <clears throat> we have a bunch of like extra information. Um, these like introns, which are these segments in between the exons, which the exons have the actual instructions for making the proteins and these introns are these regulatory regions. And they're going to get removed in this process called splicing. Um, and so when this happens, you're going to then have the exons join together.
Um, and then this is going to get further processed. It's going to get this um, cap, this um, five prime methyl, um, G, um, this five prime methyl seven G um, cap, this weird like backwards G, as well as a polyadenosine tail. Um, and so this is going to give you the mature messenger RNA. So if you want, this is no over here, if you want the, um, you're making mRNA, you're going to have to give the, the RNA polymerase, the version that's already like spliced and stuff. And you can then add a cap and a tail, which are going to help with translation as well as with the tail will help with stability. Um, if, you, if you're going for translation, remember, if you're just making RNA for RNA's sake, you don't need to worry about the cap and the tail. You can add the cap um, enzymatically um, after the fact. So they have like capping kits that you can use that have like an enzyme that's going to add a cap on. And you can also use like different cap analogs, so like different modifications. Um, you can also basically um, in, use in include the cap in the original in the initial parts of the translate transcription reaction so that you can get it added on during the reaction in terms of the tail you can add that on after the fact with a poly a polymerase which is just going to add like a string of a's or you can use like a def defined tail length um, that you have in your primer or in your plasmid um, so typically they add about 38 adenosines. Um, you can also use overlap extension PCR to add to synthesized or uncloned DNA. So you can actually buy like DNA synthesized and then you can get a, um, you can have a primer that is going to have like the promoter sequence and then you can use overlap PCR um, to basically get added, added on or you can use a single stranded DNA um, to um, to where then you have this double-stranded promoter. Um, and so you can make it this way as well. Um, but this is gonna allow you to amplify it with PCR. Um, so there are different ways that you can get templates is the basic idea. Um, and so if you're wondering about overlap extension PCR, basically you have part of it that overlaps with one and part of it that overlaps with the other. And so then you take those overlaps and you use those as start sites and then you fill in the gaps um, and so that you can add things on. So basically there are lots of different ways that you can get a template. Um, but once you have a template, then you can get, um, you can get um, the RNA polymerase to work. So the RNA polymerase, it's just gonna need that promoter. The reason why we might wanna put that cap in the tail is for the translation. Um, so this is when we're talking about like making protein from the messenger RNA. So the cap's important for multiple reasons. Um, one of the key ones is that it's going to help the ribosome latch on. When the ribosome latches on, it's then going to be able to find the, um, the start codon, so typically an AUG, and this is going to tell the ribosome to start making um, protein from that spot. And so ORS stands for open reading frame, and basically this is the instructions for making um, the protein that you want it to make. If you have um, in our cells and stuff, they, we use cap dependent RNA um, translation, um, where basically the RNA is going, the ribosome is, this cap is going to help it latch on, and then it's going to search for that AUG, find it, and then start translating. There are also ways that we can do the translation in a cap independent manner. So viruses actually take advantage of this um, and use these like internal ribosome entry sites or IRs um, to make our cells make their RNA for them without having a cap. And so these IRs are going to be these kind of like these sequences of RNA. They're going to fold up into this shape that's going to help the RNA um, kind of bind on and then um, near the start codon so that then the RNA can be translated by the ribosome. And so if we're doing things in vitro, what we can do is we can actually in um, include this internal ribosomal entry site into, um, into our, like before our construct in order to get the, the, it to be translated in the absence of the capping. And so this can help save money um, as well as steps and things like that. So some of the common ones that we use are like EMCV, BCBV, um, various IRs. Um, here's an example construct uh, adapted from this one from Thermo Fisher. And so basically here you have your RNA 
um, polymerase promoter, then you have the iris. So this promoter is going to tell the, the T7 to start making RNA from the DNA. This iris is going to tell the ribosome to start making protein from the RNA copy that the T7 RNA polymerase made. Then you're going to have the open reading frame for your protein of interest. Here they have it fused to GFP, which can serve as a sort of reporter to see if the protein is getting made, um, as well as um, like tags for purification. Um, and you can also have, you, can, you don't need the GFP, you can have various things, um, various things that you can do. Um, and so you can see here that I have these arrows. This is where um, I am making primers so that I can make copies of this um, from the template that I can then use to make the, so that I can make copies of this from the plasmid. So this is just showing you part of the plasmid and I can make copies of this region um, using PCR instead of linearizing it. And this is gonna allow me to get more amplification and not have to do as much um, work. Okay, so those are some of the things, but they're also, um, so speaking of work, um, some of the work that I am going to do that's extra is um, I'm planning to express and purify my own because as I mentioned, um, you get a, you apparently get a lot higher activity, um, you can get higher concentrations and it's apparently worth it. Um, so when I was asking people about protocols and that sort of thing, people were recommending this P266L uh, mutant. Um, so P226L, this is just saying you have a proline that has been um, changed to a leucine. So you're changing the amino acid, you're changing the protein letter. And this is going, this change um, that was identified in this paper, it's going to increase the efficiency, processivity, and fidelity. So basically what it does, is it's going to help the use of an RNA polymerase kind of scooch off from the promoter, but stay on the template. So one of the problems that you can get with T7, um, in vitro transcription is that the T7 RNA polymerase can kind of um, get stuck or in it can like create fall off and you get these basically you get these short these short abortive transcripts um, which isn't what you want. So this mutation is going to help it clear that um, clear that promoter sequence um, and so you get um, better better results. Um, there are also other mutations that will make the RNA polymerase better at using modified um, nucleotide triglycerides, so modified NTPs. Um, so basically, in that two prime position, where you have an OH in RNA and an H in DNA, you can make modifications there to do things like add, um, like make it biotinylated. Uh, make it fluorescent, various things like that. But it can also, because you don't need that two prime site in order to um, keep linking the letters together, which is why DNA can um, link the letters together. But the problem is that the, new, the, the polymerase isn't, it can get like mad at you if you try to put something there, it's not gonna like recognize that it's a letter. And so there are these different mutation, mutated versions of these seven RNA polymerase that are better at, um, they have, they're less stringent about what they accept, and so they'll let you use modified versions. Um, this can be really helpful. Um, and so a detailed protocol for T7 expression and purification and, um, in vitro transcription. Um, it, I mean, like the name of the paper makes it sound really um, scary, but it's actually a really great article to link to, um, which has really great in detail protocols for all of this stuff, um, including how to um, express and purify this T7 um, um, polymerase. And so basically it's just looks like it's just a simple bacterial overexpression um, with a his tag. So basically you have this string of histidines on the end that's going to help you purify it more easily. And then you can use like size exclusion chromatography to further polish things up and much more on those and other posts. I also got um, someone was telling me, warning me, like don't use P lice containing cells for this expression. Um, so P lice, um, basically these plasmids have these <clears throat> this lysozyme and this lysozyme is actually inhibits T7. The reason why these why these cells have this, um, why you can buy these cells that have it is because it's going to, you express a low level of this lysozyme. So you basically prevent low level expression of this T7. So kind of leaky expression that you haven't added your inducer, um, but it's kind of, you just have this low level of expression that could then cause low level of expression of your gene. If you want super duper tight control, then you can add a lot of this, you can use cells with this P lice. 
But if you have cells with these P lice, then you're going and you're using these cells to try to ex overexpress and purify T7, then you're going to get your T7 be inhibited by this P lice um, and like go purify it with stuff and have different problems. So don't do that. Okay, some final um, technical notes. So T7, we talked about how it can kind of like stop in the middle um, and but how that mutation will help prevent that. Um, but it can also sometimes add extra letters at the three prime end. So like untemplated letters. Um, and when you're doing like a runoff transcription. And so when you're doing like one of those linear templates instead of having like a T7 terminator. Um, so if you need price, precise ends, what you can do is you can do things like insert self-cleaving ribosome sequences, ribozyme sequences. So ribozyme is like a ribosome. That, uh, it's like a RNA um, enzyme. And so basically what it, these ribosomes that you add, ribosome sequences that you add are basically going to cause the RNA to cut itself off at the end. And this will give you a defined end. Um, you can also use two prime methyl modified reverse primers. Um, so these are going to destabilize the polymerase complex, which is going to prevent the untemplated addition. So it's going to reach those weird letters and then get destabilized and fall off before it can start adding random letters. Um, another thing is that for maximum efficiency, it requires these, it requires two G's at the end of the three prime promoter. Um, if you have just one, uh, that can sometimes be okay, but it really needs that G. Um, and so this is going to get added on to the beginning of your RNA. Um, and so if you don't want your RNA to start with G, this can be a problem when you're doing mRNA for like translation and stuff. It's not an issue because you still have your um, you still have your start sequence upstream. You still have like your AEG. It's not in. The, it's not going to be affected. It's still down here. Another thing is that some things recommended adding a little extra in front of the T7 promoter to really help it latch on better. Um, and this is one of the reasons why some people might use linearization of their template instead of PCR still, um, because you can sometimes get better efficiency um, because the T7 has more room to kind of latch on. Um, okay, another thing is that the protocols typically add inorganic pyrophosphatase um, to prevent magnesium precipitation. So basically when these letters are getting added, so this is showing um, DNA, but we're talking about RNA here. Um, when these letters are getting added, same type of thing, you have this, they're added as in this like nucleotide triphosphate, so they have these three phosphate groups. When they get added, you kick off two of those phosphates as the pyrophosphate. Um, this pyrophosphate can chelate magnesium, so basically it can kind of bind to the magnesium and hide the magnesium, which the, um, which the enzymes need. And then it can also like make magnesium precipitate out. And so this is a problem. So what you can do is you can add this enzyme called pyrophosphatase, which is basically going to do this. It's going to hydrolyze the pyrophosphate um, so that it's not going to um, precipitate out your magnesium. Okay. So that is the basics of all this T7 stuff and I hope it helps.